Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video of Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on YouTube. All right, today's video um, is the winner of this week's Patrons Pick Poll. So once a week, I put up a poll of videos that uh, our patron um, subscribers or members can vote on to get it uh, featured on the channel. And this week, this one won, which is uh, D-Day by the folks over at Extra History. So they do a little short mini-series. So I believe there are four episodes, I want to say, um, on this. i got to double-check that, but I think four episodes on D-Day. So that is a popular topic. Not surprising to, to me that it had one. And I love this series, and um, they're very supportive of our channel. So it really, uh, I really appreciate it if you go down to the description below and click the link, which will be to the original video. Give them a like and subscribe if you have not already yet. Uh, because again, they're supportive of this channel and um, I love their stuff. So I'm excited to do this. So D-Day, of course, the Allied invasion in the West uh, in France in World War II is seen as one of the most famous invasions, battles, whatever you want to call it in history. Um, the largest amphibious invasion in history as well. And is a big part of... Uh, World War II history in general. So um, if you would like to join our Patreon, a link will be down below. Uh, memberships or whatever uh, start at as little as a dollar a month, which will get you access to polls and be a great support to the channel. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So this is going to be episode one today with this video, D-Day, The Great Crusade. Let's check it out. When the signal is given, the whole circle of avenging Churchill. nations will hurl themselves upon the foe and batter out the life of the cruelest tyranny which has ever sought Hitler, to bar the progress of mankind. That signal comes today. This episode is sponsored by Wargaming. New players can download World of Tanks and use the code NEPTUNE for free goodies. Link in the Video description. Games. D-Day, June 6th, 1944. Months of effort have been building up to this day. Throughout England, half a million men have been gathered at staging areas to strike across the channel as soon as the signal is given. Men from the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, France, Greece, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, and Poland. You know, the thing people usually, usually people remember, um... You know Britain and, and United States, but then I think a next tier of people usually know how important uh, Canada was, um, as storming one of the beaches. But not a lot of people know about all these other nations. I think it's pretty fringe there, yeah, to to learn about how many nations were involved. Now again, especially United States, Britain, Canada, uh, being a part of D-Day. Um, in my American, I had an American military history class in college, and we spent pretty much the whole day on D-Day, like a whole, and it was a long, it was one of those classes where you meet once um, a week, and it was, you know, two, three hours, and the professor wanted to basically just spend a whole day on it, which was, was cool, and um, just going into this, there was so much, bef you know, before I had taken that, that, that class and, and, and learned that day in school, um, there was way more prep work and deception and stuff into D-Day um, than I had any clue of before. Like, it, it was incredible how much went into this. And it was still something that they were not necessarily confident that it would work. I don't know if you've ever heard of, um, or uh, ever seen Eisenhower's, uh, uh, General Eisenhower's letter that he had drafted for if D-Day had failed. It's kind of eerie because um, he had one plan that if it didn't work, you know, he was going to have this public statement. So it was one of the most prepared things I've ever heard of in in, um, in military history. But even then, they didn't know how um, successful it would be. So I'm excited to learn more and get a refresher because um, it's been a while uh, since I had that class and learned a lot of the real specifics about D-Day. So I'm really excited for this little series. Thanks for voting on it, everybody. Today, we'll be telling the American story, as best it can be told in a few short minutes, and over the coming weeks, America. thanks to the generous support of Wargaming, we will tell the story of three of the other major players involved. But that story begins with a dinner in Tehran in 1943. Oh, For the conference. first time, the leaders of the most Tehran powerful conference. allied nations, the United States, the USSR, and the British Empire, met in one room. Man, FDR was not doing very well by his time. He was, um, 
well, he gets elected to four terms, doesn't, you know, finish out the fourth. And by this time, yeah, he was, his polio was so bad, he was pretty much wheelchair bound all the time. We you know some about Franklin Dono Roosevelt. Um, he didn't like to be photographed or, you know, f- filmed in his wheelchair, which is often why you, you won't see him with it. Um, and very much, especially in his older years, but you can see in these meetings with these photo ops, he doesn't look very good. He's, and I know, just imagine the, uh, physical and mental turmoil he had gone through with those four, um, with these four terms, like the, some of the worst parts of American history, he inherited the great depression and then had to, uh, try to stay out of the war and then got into the war and I was fighting it. And it's very difficult here. It's a, this is 1943, um, when fighting is really bad. Uh, but yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't live to see the end of this. He ends up dying, um, the month that the war in Europe ended there in April of, of 45. For years, Stalin, his nation battered by the Nazi invasion and bearing the brunt of the human cost of the war against Germany, had pressed the Allies to open up a second front to the war by invading France. The British had pushed yeah. back, arguing for operations in North Africa, and then an assault on Italy. But now, with Stalin the USSR the winning the on the Eastern Front, the demands from Stalin became harder to deny. And Excuse me, I'm snacking as well. <laughs> Joseph Stalin has the most leverage of this meeting. He's the one that's doing the fighting. People that are dying, right? Americans have no leverage. They're not even being attacked. Britain fended off, of course, the um, the Blitz, right? And, and the German invasion. But Stalin is definitely in the position that has the bigger hand. Um, the most, most to do. Because, I mean... The, he's the one that's that's keeping the the Germans at bay and has done so for years um, quite successfully for the most. Well, I mean, they're losing incredible amount of lives, but um, they're also able to push back, you know, eventually, uh, eventually here. So yeah, they're in the biggest position, and he, Stalin has the most leverage in this this whole meeting. And simultaneously, everyone started to think of the post-war settlement. If the Allies won like without Stalin British and American troops all. liberating Western Europe, how could they stop the USSR from claiming huge swaths of land and perhaps even at least politically mm-hmm. dominating the continent? Remember, going into World War II, the Western nations feared uh, Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union and communism more than they did Adolf Hitler and uh, what was going on in Germany. And so this alliance that that's here is only in... F- place because you have a common enemy they don't trust stalin i mean they barely trust him even to fight with him there but they're especially fearful of a post-world war ii soviet union right so they yeah it's it's a scary situation but a lot of people maybe don't realize that that they don't really like the soviet union they're they're uh, they're allying with them kind of a common necessity but want to make sure every deal and everything they make has something where they can keep an eye on this the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union can't exploit the the alliance and the relationship. And so an agreement was made out in the deserts of Iran. The Western powers would open up a second front by invading France in May of 1944. Plans were drawn up. An amphibious operation of this size had never never been been tried. Men and material would have to be drawn back from around the world. New technologies would have to be invented. Engineering feats previously only discussed in conference rooms would have to be put to the test under wartime conditions. But the first decision that had to be made was where to land. There were two possible targets, Calais, the closest point in Europe to England, or Normandy, one of the farthest on the Channel Coast. The famous thing is that up there in the the upper red X, famous thing I'm sure they're going to get into is that is where Hitler thought it would be. And move, what, like a million troops, I believe, to Calais. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of troops in Normandy and stuff, but uh, centralizing it there, it's the shortest point between the English Channel. And also, uh, we'll, we'll see if they get into it. But um, there was a lot of deception made up here in uh, this part of Britain, right across from Calais, um, where you get things like Patton's inflatable army and some of that stuff, where they were trying to make like a decoy army here to make the Germans and make Hitler think that Calais is going to be the point of entry. Um, we'll see if they get into that, but that's just a, a, another uh, interesting story is they wanted it to wanted the, the, the allies wanted them to think it would be a Calais point in Europe to England or Normandy, one of the farthest on the channel coast. 
Calais was the sane, sensible place to land, but it had two notable disadvantages. First, terrain in which you could easily get bogged down, and second, the fact that it was the sane, sensible place to land. Reviewing the battle Obvious. plan, Eisenhower and Montgomery were in agreement. They wanted the element of surprise, with the possibility of being able to rush off the beaches. So the decision was made. Normandy, it would be. But this would require one of the greatest counterintelligence operations ever attempted to keep the secrets safe. Not to mention the equipment and the manpower on an even greater scale. Entire harbors had to be fabricated which could be shipped over from England. More landing craft needed time to roll off the factory lines, so the operation was delayed until June. Finally, the day arrives. June 4th, 1944. Planes prep, final drills are run through, tens of thousands of men board ships for the invasion, and then the rain starts to roll in. Soon it becomes a storm. Ferocious waves sweep of the course, channel. Right? Clouds completely block the sky. High winds buffet any craft that ventures on sea, land, and especially air. Eisenhower is forced to make the decision. The attack must be delayed. Rain continues to pour the next day. A council of allied commanders is called. If they delay again, they won't be able to launch until July. They need to do the channel crossing at night. They need to do commando raids and mine sweeping when the unsuspecting Germans will have the fewest patrols out. But for a crossing of this magnitude, they need nearly full moon visibility. Even if they did decide to brave a launch without the full moon, tidal conditions wouldn't be right for another two weeks. What do they do? They've got thousands of men already holed up on boats, getting seasick and nervous and just plain stir crazy. You know, they um, they they also kept the date because, I mean, they were they had to be pretty open about when the date was. But they were um, not like the, the soldiers did not know when this day was going to be. They basically had to be be ready at a minute's notice. Now, that, a lot of that was intentional. It's a massive army that's being uh, established here in southern England. Right. And the biggest armies ever assembled. Um, and they had to try to keep it as secret as possible. I mean, it's it, you can't hide like a million, two million troops that are amassing. Um, but try to keep it there. So they intentionally kind of left the soldiers a little bit in the dark um, about when exactly it would be. And um, again, so so information wouldn't get out. Another thing that was interesting is they stopped um, allowing the troops to send letters home for a while because they didn't want even any information like that to get out about where they are exactly in placement. So there was a, a basically an information lockdown that for a lot of the information going into the troops, but um, uh, uh, information going out as well. They've already started moving equipment and forces into staging areas, which can clearly only be targeting one place, Normandy. And they've had to alert enough people up and down the chain as to the nature of the operation that with each passing day, the odds of keeping their landing location a secret plummet. True. But to cross in this weather, that would be madness. Then a captain is decisions. ushered in. He's an RAF meteorologist, and he is about to make what may well be the most consequential weather report of all time. He says he believes it's going to be clear on the 6th. Eisenhower nods. The operation is a go. 6,000 ships begin to steam across the channel. Minesweepers fan out ahead of them, clearing a path. How For weeks, the you know, Allied the forces have bombed the German Air Force in the region nearly to oblivion. No enemy interceptors exist to spot the waves of gliders and transport planes carrying 17,000 right? airborne troops. The ships won't reach the beaches until dawn, but the airborne infantry has night work to do. First in are the Pathfinders, the men whose job it is to light the drop zones for all the other parachute infantry. Imagine how sucky that job is. You're the first ones in. You gotta sneak in and find the paths, right? You're the first line. Yikes. Of the four planes carrying these Pathfinders, one overshoots their target, another has to bail before ever getting to France, and the remaining two kept most of their signaling gear in the ditched plane, leaving them desperately trying to signal the paratroopers by waving flashlights at the passing airplanes. The paratrooper drop goes even worse. Scattered by enemy anti-aircraft fire and blinded by low clouds, paratroopers jump from altitudes that are either too high, leaving them drifting slowly, unable to do anything but watch as enemy guns spit shrapnel up at them, or too low, breaking bones on landing as their parachutes don't have enough time to slow their fall. They're scattered all over, many of them landing miles from their drop zones, some landing in marshes or rivers, others being slaughtered as they drop right into the middle Gosh. of the enemy. 
It was a harrowing and confusing night of chaotic firefights and desperate small unit actions. But the more veteran of the American airborne troops, groups like the Screaming Eagles and the 505th, managed to pull together to capture crucial road junctions, communication points, and bridges, and even destroyed some of the artillery batteries that would imperil the landing at Normandy. And they would hold fast, delaying or preventing any counterattack that might sweep the impending invasion back into the sea. Then, there's the initial bombardment. Allied bombing runs go astray, causing massive damage to the civilian centers in Normandy, but doing little to weaken the dug-in mm. German positions. As dawn breaks, though, the Allied gunners can finally see their targets, and the bombardment becomes far more effective, softening up the beach for the initial assault. Yeah. But there's little time remaining. Amazing with, with how much work they did in the scouting areas and trying to soften up the areas how difficult the landing is still going to be because they i mean they did they went to exhaustive efforts of trying to uh, paratroop people and behind enemy lines and bomb some of the um, um supply lines and some of the first defenses but even that didn't do much to um keep it that safe because this i mean they'll get to it obviously but those first days the first hours were um incredible high casualties until the troops scheduled landing at 6.30 a.m. on June 6, 1944, the klaxons sound and the assault craft are released. They plow through the chop, men huddled in their tin shells as German fire pours down, sinking entire landing craft to the bottom of the sea just off the Normandy coast. Mm. Then the assault craft hit the, the beach, ramps drop, and men charge out. But on Utah Beach, things have already gone horribly. The men look around them and the terrain's all wrong they've landed on the wrong beach. Uh, Luckily for the Americans, the oldest man in the invasion, and the only general to actually join these ground troops, Teddy Roosevelt Jr., happens to have landed with them. The local commanders ask him what they should do, and living up to his namesake, he simply responds, we'll start the war from right here. He huh. correctly assessed that the beach that they'd landed on was actually a better, more easily takeable landing point than the one that the senior staff had assigned them. In a miracle of heroism and logistical coordination, he managed to reroute the entire Utah Beach invasion force to his location, direct the battle, and continuously rally the men as he walked the beach with his cane, waving his pistol. <laughs> his new Utah what Beach legend, would be huh? the first beach successfully overrun, and for his attack. actions there, he would be awarded the Medal of Honor. Omaha, though, was a different story. That's a Here, the pre-landing bombardment... This is the one you often see in the movies, um of any D-Day movie or any D-Day game is the, is the Omaha beach, um, for how just insanely bloody it was. Let's go back five seconds. Honor. Omaha though, was a different story. Here, the pre-landing bombardment had been even less effective. The seas were choppy, landing craft took on water, and men tried to bail with their helmets. Some of the landing craft sank, and those that landed were filled with retching, seasick men. Much of the armored support that was supposed to follow them foundered in the waves, or simply got picked off as they hit the shore. Soon, the men were all pinned down against a small shingle of land that provided what little cover there was to be found on the beach. Many of the units had taken heavy casualties, and much of the command staff was dead. With units getting washed... It would have been chaos, because um, there would have been no command structure, with, with so many randomly... Or random people dying there, both both uh, high level and, and low level, it would have been chaos there to have any kind of structure and direction there. I mean, they have they have their orders and stuff like that, but more specifically, it'd be hard. You wouldn't know who's in who's in who. What, you know, you'd have to know the chain of command because one person goes down and someone's got to fill that, and that would have been very hard to navigate during the chaos of this fighting. Which again, for a lot of these soldiers, is the first combat they've ever seen in their life. And it's some of the some of the scariest and uh, most challenging that you can have in in general. To shore in the wrong places, or scattered in the desperate scramble to try to get to the small ridge of sand that served as cover, the assault had become hopelessly disorganized. The second wave met with much the same fate. Hopelessly bogged down, withdrawal from Omaha Beach was considered, but it was the vital linking point between the British and American forces. As the day wore on, a number of Ranger units began to rally and scaled the bluffs, finally managing to assault German positions on the heights. At the same time, several of the naval ships came dangerously close to the beach to provide more effective support fire just as the German ammunition began to run out. Even after all of this, Omaha Beach wasn't truly cleared by the end of the 6th. 
But as the sun began to set on those bloodied beaches, it was clear that the American forces were there to stay. Join us next time as we join the British for their covert efforts to keep the biggest invasion in history a secret. Cool. Cool. I'm very, I'd be very interested in Thank that. Um, I love the, the deceptive stuff about of, of D-Day. Like I was saying earlier in the beginning of the video, some of the coolest things I learned in my American history class was the deception used at D-Day. So I'm excited to, to learn more of that in video two. But that'll be next time. All right, everybody, if you like the video, again, go down to the description. Um, head over there. Be sure you give a like and subscribe over to the Extra History people. They are awesome, very supportive of this channel. Um, this video uh, was chosen by the patron pledgers, like I said, beginning uh, in the beginning of the video. If you'd like to join, link down below as well. If you'd like to be part of our history community on Discord, there's also a link down below. I'd love to have you ab um, aboard as well. If you have not subbed to my channel, I'd love to have you around, be part of the little community of history lovers and people wanting to learn more about history. And hopefully you're enjoying the, um, the reactions, the commentary that I give, and hope to see you again um, many times here in the future. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye.